Dr. Rukshida, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Uh, Dr. Rukshida, uh, you have had a fair amount of experience working with women from economically disadvantaged sections of uh, society. Uh, how common are in instances of depression and anxiety among these women? And more importantly, how do they identify it? Um, when we're looking at India as a whole, uh, we understand that the lifetime prevalence for common mental illnesses like depression and anxiety in women particularly is far higher than in men. Uh, so for in women, it's all, uh, you know, anywhere from 12% to 25%. But in men, we see only from five to maybe 12%. So we understand that the, there are more number of women with depression, anxiety, and stress-related illnesses and disorders. Um, amongst this, definitely depression is higher than anxiety and other stress-related issues as well. Um, when they do come up with a certain amount of complaints and symptoms, a lot many will come with more physical symptoms um, instead of just kind of being able to verbalize their emotional state because a lot of the times there's struggle for survival. So they don't really have the time to sit down and intuit and actually figure out what's going on. So a lot of these women face a lot of uh, difficult lives where day-to-day -day survival is dependent on day-to-day -day activities. Um, so a lot of them will do uh, will uh, definitely come up with somatic illnesses, physical complaints, headaches and stomach aches and neck aches. And uh, a lot of them will come up with, I don't like anything. I don't feel like doing anything. I'm doing everything that I need to do, but I don't feel like doing anything. Uh, very few will actually also come up and say the usual depression symptoms, like I'm feeling sad, and I'm crying all the time, even when there's no particular trigger that I'm crying about. Um, of course, a lot of women do come up with, unfortunately, suicidal ideas. They might not be actively suicidal, but there are definitely a lot of passive suicidal ideas where they will voice things like, it's, I feel it's better if I die. I don't know why I'm living. I'm tired. I can't handle this anymore. Uh, so a lot of these people, a lot of these women will come up with something like this, um, but they find it still easier to complain of physical illnesses than of emotional or mental symptoms. So they, they do not have a word, but they give you allied symptoms and you as uh, a doctor have to figure out, trace it back uh, to depression. Um, um, well, a lot of the times, uh, like I said, they will complain of medical, uh, uh, physical symptoms, uh, not that they cannot express in terms of that I'm feeling sad, but those words are not that easy because a lot of the times, unfortunately, they also feel that, but feelings, I'm feeling sad because my life is not okay. So they feel it's situational, it's relational. They don't really think that, okay, this is a pervasive state of mind, which may be a disorder. And uh, they don't recognize that their cognitive symptoms are also taking a backseat where they feel, uh, you know, less sharp, less intelligent, because a lot of these uh, women, unfortunately, are not in white collar jobs or in professions where it requires them to be uh, skillful for using their other kinds of intellect. Um, so yes, definitely even now when we see, we see a lot of women coming with, um, with, with physical symptoms, definitely. But a, a lot of them will also tell you they can describe anxiety much better than they can describe depression. Okay. Uh, many of them have migrated to uh, cities. Uh, in the isolating environment of an urban landscape, what is their coping mechanism? Uh, so when we are talking about women migrating, we need to understand it's not only just about migrating from rural to urban setups, even within an urban setup, a woman is migrating, especially when, because you know, when they get married and they are in an entirely new environment. So very often we tend to forget that because especially in the Indian subcontinent, the way our cultural system is set up and the way our households are set up, we enter into a household instead of making our own new household, isn't it? So that migration also brings with it a sense of isolation, like you just mentioned, um, because it's a 
different culture, it's different food, it's even different timings, especially if you see that if it's a migrating from a rural background to an urban background, there may be less space, um, there's definitely less air, especially in a city like Mumbai, where homes are really, really small, um, and really, really, um, uh, you know, you're cluttered with no windows and no, no sunshine and no, no, no daylight in that sense in a lot of places. So definitely those are, again, challenges as well. Um, they are used to maybe physical hardships of different kind. So, so those challenges are uh, challenges have changed and it does take a while for them to kind of find their footing uh, so unless and until the household that they are kind of migrating with or migrating into unless and until they are a little bit more receptive and easy uh, and ad adaptable and adjustable they do struggle quite a lot initially for the first few months mm -hmm. and how do they uh, access quality health care Um, unfortunately, in India, we know where if a man is suffering from any ailment, they will definitely reach a specialist. But if a woman is suffering from an ailment, they'll reach maximum, if they're lucky, uh, to a general physician and that too with a significant amount of delay. Uh, so as far as access to mental health is concerned, that's in fact worse than other specialties that we may uh, kind of see. Um, as far as access to good mental health is concerned, very few of them reach a uh, psychiatric setups or mental health services, unfortunately. Um, uh, those of them who are lucky enough to even know uh, somewhat the lay of the land as such may get some information from their neighbors and sometimes even their family physicians that, okay, you need to go to this hospital and see the psychiatrist there. Uh, luckily, at least in places like in Bombay, uh, in Mumbai, we have a lot of uh, hospitals and public health centers where a psychiatrist is available. They, we may not have psychologists and psychiatric nurses, definitely, but we do have a psychiatrist available where they can at least get diagnosed and started to get started on medications if they require. So, but again, the, the availability is uh, in terms of, uh, you know, availability of mental health services is definitely not uniform, even in an urban setup. So some center, some areas of an urban setup are better equipped than others. So if you are, um, if you're lucky enough to be living in those areas, then it's easier for you to access. Um, uh, though definitely because of uh, social media and the technology, a lot more information now is available to these women than it used to be in the past. So uh, th that has also changed quite a lot. A lot of them will actually the first access to a specialist for a woman uh, would be a gynecologist yes because that's something that everybody understands that okay if it's a gynecological issue or if it's an obstructive tissue a uh, like childbearing issue then you must see a specialist um so th so that's usually their first point uh, you know contact point with a specialist uh, under these circumstances so access to mental health is unfortunately still not as great as uh, we want it to be we want it to be what can we, what are one or two things that we as a society can do to create awareness about uh, mental health issues amongst this section of the population? Um, so everybody has to contribute. It's not just in terms of oh, what the government is doing or what uh, you know the municipal corporations are doing because they they are going to put up flyers and posters in the you know PHCs and all of that. But one has to be able to go there. And one also has to be able to be illiterate enough to read it. Um, so I think each individual, like suppose if I have some kind of domestic help, uh, you know, people who are helping me, uh, I need to let them know, I need to let, I need to ask them, are you okay? Do you feel okay? Especially if I, if somebody is under my employ for a long period of time, I can see, right? I can see that, oh, you know, this person's not feel doing that great right now. And unfortunately, you know, we know that the symptoms at the risk of depression and anxiety go higher if you're female. Um, if you're of a certain age between 18 and 49, uh, if you are uh, of lower socioeconomic background, if you are low in education, if you are exposed to domestic violence, uh, we know that these people are more at risk. So when we know that, okay, somebody who's helping me in my home 
is more challenged, I might be able to kind of, you know, I might have a conversation with them occasionally that, listen, if this, this happens, you know that these kind of doctors are available. For that, we have to have our mental health literacy at par, isn't it? Which yes. in itself is also a challenge. So my first step would, my first advice would be, first, you need to get, you know, literate as far as mental health is concerned. And then you need to look around you, keep your eyes and ears open for people who may be challenged or facing some challenges challenges because you we, and we know that untreated and chronic uh, depression and suicide is a high risk of uh, uh, chronic uh, depression and anxiety is high risk for suicide. So not only is the productivity going down on a daily basis, but we're also losing young people to a very, very preventable death. And of course, you know, this leads to other issues as well, uh, because we I always say that there's no health without women's mental health, because if I'm a woman and I have depression and then I'm having, when I have children, uh, yes. that's going to be difficult and more of a genetic vulnerability that I'm passing on to the kids as well. Um, it changes me as a mother, how I would raise my kids if I am suffering from a mental illness myself. So all of these factors are something that we as individuals also need to recognize and the communities need to get together as well. Those people who are working the grassroots levels, they need to improve improve their skills. Um, we do employ a lot of, uh, you know, we do encourage a lot of uh, the Anganwadi workers and the public health volunteers uh, with information about depression, with information about anxiety, and we do tell them to let them know and spread the word, and they do a good job, but there are only so few of them. Uh, so another contact, just like I said, that the first contact usually is uh, with the gynecologist, uh, then we need to improve the knowledge base of the gynecologist and the nurses and the social workers working in those departments, because those are the women, they, they are going to come in contact with this, you know, women, but also especially vulnerable women, because women going through premenstrual syndromes, women going through perinatal, uh, antenatal, as well as postnatal mental health issues, and women going through the transition of menopause have a high higher degree of incidence of depression and anxiety. So this group can also really make a lot of difference in terms of spreading awareness and catching them, uh, you know, um, um, filtering those cases and referring the cases about for mental health activities. Of course, there's a lot much, a lot more that we can do. Improving um, mental health literacy in schools will go a long way in helping the entire society. Because when kids learn something in school, they go and apply it in real world. Um, and if they learn something more about taking care of themselves, they'll recognize that their parents, their, especially their mothers, might not be doing so well and coping so well, and they will have less stigma and they will be the ones to encourage their mothers to go take help. Uh, most of the, uh, the, yeah, the women that I see in my OPD, they will be accompanied by a child because the child is the one who is more literate and the child is the one who's going to remember. So, so many times I explain to the child, okay, give your mother these, these medicines and she has to come back and see me on this day. So that makes it easy as well. So yes, we are saying, uh, you know, that yeah, um, uh, you know, um, we might be burdening the child, but you know what, the child is gonna be burdened if the mother is unwell. So if the yeah. child can help the mother in some way, yes, it's yes. not really going to be a burden. And, uh, and we, we, so we, you know, these are small little things that we can do to improve awareness within women. And women are very good about taking care of themselves if they know how to. So if you let them know that this is what you should do and this is how you must uh, take care of yourself, they're very good. They follow instructions, they care of, take care of themselves because they understand that without taking care of themselves, they cannot take care of others. And we know women are the more uh, care, you know, they do more caregiving activity than men and than other people in the family, isn't it? Yeah, very often, you know, I see uh, our maids, for instance, you know, they stand in groups and they have a heart to heart conversation at the beginning of each day or the end of each day. Um, they talk about all their problems. Uh, and then, you know, half an hour later, they go about leading their normal lives. So I often wonder, is that their uh, equivalent of, uh, you know, um, group therapy or is that a coping mechanism that they have evolved? It's definitely a coping mechanism. And those women uh, that they're chatting in groups, they're a support group. I wouldn't say that there's, it's a group therapy per se, because it's more like a venting, more like sharing and, you know, um, maybe kind of offering each other help. 
but and that support group is very integral especially in mumbai we also know that women who are going to work they have these train groups where they meet these particular oh, yeah. women only oh, yeah. on their train journeys that's a huge uh, support group as well and women talking to women bonding creating that community it's also very very inherently uh, biologically inherent in women and that gives them comfort and that re- definitely reduces their risk of a psychiatric illness so i uh, we all encourage women to talk to each other because they know more about themselves by talking to other women they know how to take care of themselves and they will ask help it's easier for a woman to ask another woman for help um mm, that yeah. it is sometimes even in our own families unfortunately the the social structure is still constructed in a way that's not very easy for women to kind of even ask for help even when they want to so mm. women helping out women and women lifting up women is very essential component even in mental health and not just like in the job sector thank you so much dr rukshida i really learned uh, some things that are you know kind of opened my eyes Uh, women lifting each other women supporting each other in the corporate world we talk of that in a very different context but you spoke about it in a very different context uh, in the context of uh, helping each other um, go through mental health uh, issues uh, i loved what you said about um, creating awareness in children um, and you know i i made a note of the point you said about are we burdening the children the children would be burdened in any case if they had a parent who was going through an issue but here you are equipping them with the knowledge and with the ability to improve that situation in in uh, in a situation where the mother is perhaps not uh, literate so thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure that talking to you my pleasure and thank you for talking to me when you were on vacation <laughs> there's always time for mental health <laughs> thank you thank you on the